And on the 57th day, Jack Donlin and Ed Garvey rested, and the cry was heard throughout the land, play ball. And in hamlets like Chicago, the fans returned to the stadium by Lake Michigan to watch the Bears take on the Detroit Lions. And the Lions smiled and had gladness in their hearts, for they were 2-0 with one victory already coming over these same Bears. The Chicagoans, however, had an area win and two early season tries. But a new playoff format gave the young Bruins hope, and a win today would be an important first step. In the Lions' den, players like union leader Stan White now prepared to tally his percentage of gross tackles on Chicago ball carriers. Until the strike, White and the rest of the Detroit defense had been difficult to sell. Detroit's offense still moved best on the ground, but the Lions were strong in the air when passes came into Freddie Scott's territory. After the eight-week layoff, Scott was anxious to get started once more. And the cry of give it to Walter was ready to be heard from box seat to bleacher. Peyton, the Bears star, rested and ready, would see heavy duty. But so would rookie quarterback Jim McMahon, the new face that Bear Brass was pinning its late season hopes upon. Other youngsters on offense included second year wideout Ken Marjoram, a possession receiver who hoped to spark a Chicago offense that in the past had relied quite heavily on its running game. Yea, verily, the strike appeared over at last, and the players appeared with their game faces on. Football was back with the Detroit Lions and the Chicago Bears on the NFL Game of the Week. It was no secret that the Bears wanted to win badly after two sluggish performances back in September. On the game's first series, they came storming after Lion quarterback Eric Hipple. It was a scene that would be repeated often throughout the day. Hipple would be frequently forced to throw the ball before he wanted. And this resulted in the game's first key play, an interception by number 44, Terry Schmidt. Bear critics have often accused the team of overusing Walter Payton. But on Chicago's first march, Walter never touched the ball. Instead, most of the yardage was picked up by backfield mate Matt Suey, number 26, who accounted for 30 yards on the drive. The Lions kept the Bears from the end zone. The kicker John Rivetto salvaged matters with a 51-yard field goal, the third longest in Bears history. Down three to nothing, the Lions elected to try the pass again. But this time, Hipple kept it to quick completions that did not call for prolonged blocking. Over the middle, the quick hitter was perfectly suited for Detroit tight end David Hill, number 81. Detroit also began to move when the ball was given to their star back, Billy Sims, number 20. But the biggest offensive spark came when the Lion defense got a turnover deep in Bear territory. Jim McMahon threw it right to cornerback Wayne Smith, number 44, and the Lions had their first big break. Detroit needed only 12 yards for a touchdown, and Hipple got 11 of them on a quarterback rollout. Inside the one, however, the Bears stiffened, and two Detroit runs into the line produced negligible results. Yeah. 
On third and goal, Hipple faked it to Sims, then escaped Chicago pursuit to find wide receiver Mark Nichols, number 86, for the game's first touchdown. Another look shows that it wasn't the play fake, but Hipple's ability to avoid two blitzing linebackers, including number 50 Mike Singletary. Hipple's elusiveness was the key to the Detroit touchdown. It had taken the Lions 13 minutes to score their first touchdown but it was only a matter of seconds until they chalked up another. McMahon threw his second consecutive interception, and Detroit added six more points. Ten-year veteran Ray Oldham, number 23, returned the theft 35 yards, and the Lions appeared to be picking up right where they left off before the strike. Unfortunately for the Bears, they too resembled their 0-2 team of September. When you're down and troubled and need a helping hand in Chicago, you turn to the feet of Walter Payton. And as usual, Payton delivered. Peyton carved out 65 first half yards that helped the young Bears regain their composure. It also made Lion defenders aware of the run and they had to respect it. For Detroit linebacker Gary Cobb, number 53, it meant having to hesitate just a bit at the beginning of the play, read run or pass, then act accordingly. That little bit of hesitation helped open up the Chicago passing game as Bear receivers began to find seams in the Lion zone. Pass completion to James Scott, number 89, was one of McMahon's best of the day. A second look reveals that the rookie quarterback threaded it between a group of Lions while rolling to the opposite side of the field. More outstanding play was turned in by the Chicago pass rush, which kept constant pressure on Hipple throughout the entire first half. It was this constant threat that finally forced Hipple into a costly mistake. An interception by number 24, cornerback Jeff Fisher. An interception had set up Detroit's first touchdown, and such was the case with the Bears. McMahon wasted little time going for the end zone and second-year receiver Ken Marjoram, number 82. Marjoram's leaping catch electrified the Soldier Field crowd, as it was easily the most spectacular play of the day. Coming just before the half, it helped the Bears regain some lost confidence. It also made Kenny Marjoram an instant Windy City hero. For a while, the half had been all Detroit's, but with a few quarterback sacks, Peyton runs, and one remarkable catch, Chicago had fought back. With the grab, the Bears now trail by only four, and in the second half, they would again rally behind a pressuring defense and the arm of Jim McMahon to bring about a most exciting conclusion.
After cutting Detroit's lead to 14 to 10 late in the second quarter, the Chicago Bears emerged from their locker room confident that they could win their first game for head coach Mike Ditka. Ditka decided to start rookie Jim McMahon at quarterback, and McMahon picked up where he had left off in the first half, throwing to Ken Marjoram. But the Bears' offense quickly ground to a halt as an aggressive Lions front seven ran over Chicago's offensive line, shutting down Walter Payton and the Bears' running game that had been so effective in the opening half. The main man for the Lions was number 60, Bubba Baker, one of the NFL's resident free spirits, who also happens to be one of its finest defensive ends, particularly against the pass. Baker's sack of McMahon forced a Chicago punt, but the Bears' defense was just as stingy as Detroit's. Billy Sims did not find much running room as the game appeared to evolve into a battle of hard-hitting defense. Jim McMahon saw to it that some offense was injected into the contest. McMahon was the Bears' first pick in the last college draft, and he was expected to give Chicago its best quarterback play in a long time. McMahon's critics said that he was not mobile enough to evade an NFL pass rush, but against the Lions, he proved them all wrong. McMahon's mobility distinguished Chicago's second possession of the third quarter as he marched the Bears deep into Lions territory. This rollout pass to Payton was nullified by a clipping penalty, but that did not slow McMahon down a bit. On the next play, the rookie, after another rollout, found Emery Moorhead in the end zone for a Chicago touchdown. McMahon's toss to Moorhead covered 28 yards and it gave the Bears a 17 to 14 lead midway through period three. It was now up to Chicago's defense. The Lions immediately attacked with their explosive offensive weapon, Billy Sims. Sims picked up 17 yards, then quarterback Eric Hipple dropped back to pass. It appeared that Hipple's arm was nicked as he attempted to throw, but whatever happened, the ball ended up in the arms of Chicago's Dan Hampton. The only problem for the Bears was a penalty that wiped out the interception. Granted a reprieve, Hipple went back to the air to get the Lions offense going. Dexter Bussey's 21-yard catch and carry brought Detroit to the Bears' seven-yard line. At that point, Chicago's gambling defensive unit came up with a big play. A safety blitz by number 25 Todd Bell dropped Hipple for a nine-yard loss. On the next play, Chicago again tried to shake up the Detroit quarterback, this time sending cornerback Leslie Frazier on an outside blitz. However, Frazier was a bit too zealous in doing his job, and he was penalized for hitting Hipple above the shoulders. The personal foul gave the Lions a first and goal on the Chicago eight-yard line. 
In 1981, Eric Hipple took over as the Lions' starting quarterback in the seventh week of the season. What Hipple did so well was exhibit a flair for the big play. Completing a relatively low 50% of his passes, he always seemed to get the Lions into the end zone. Against the Bears, Hipple appeared to do just that on a crucial third and goal late in the third quarter. This apparent touchdown to Tracy Porter never really happened as the officials ruled that Hipple was already down at the 15-yard line. Detroit settled for a field goal, tying the game at 17. McMahon had played well in his first NFL start through most of three quarters. But for the Bears to gain their first win of the 1982 season, the rookie would have to perform under pressure in the final period. When he ended the third period with an errant toss that settled gently into the hands of James Hunter, number 28, it appeared that McMahon would wither under the fourth quarter spotlight. The Lions went right to Sims, and number 20 responded with drive-sustaining chunks of yardage. But whenever Detroit seemed to be moving the ball well, the Bears' defense stuck its nose right in the way. A determined pass rush accounted for two sacks late in the fourth quarter. One by linebacker Mike Singletary, number 50. And the other credited to Steve McMichael. Bears had prevented Hipple, Sims, and the rest of the Lions' offense from coming up with a big play all game long. And the members of the defense had the battle scars to prove it. The fourth quarter was winding down in the 17-17 tie, and Chicago and Jim McMahon had one last shot at defeating the Lions. The Bears regained possession with 49 ticks left in regulation. Could the rookie quarterback pull this one out for the Bears? After a run and an incompletion, McMahon again demonstrated his mobility, this time adding poise to his growing list of attributes as he found Ricky Watts along the sideline to stop the clock. What followed was simply incredible, and it would have been incredible for Terry Bradshaw or Joe Montana or any quarterback in the NFL. With 17 seconds left, McMahon lofted a perfect pass to tight end Emery Moorhead, streaking down the middle of the field. Moorhead was dragged down from behind at the Detroit one-yard line with seven seconds remaining in the game. Lost in the excitement over McMahon's amazing performance was the play of Moorhead, number 87. A free agent, Moorhead caught the go-ahead touchdown in the third quarter before his big catch brought Chicago to the brink of victory. Another look at the play of the game reveals both McMahon's poise and Moorhead's speed. A former wide receiver, Moorhead has the ability to outrun many of the NFL's defensive backs. On this occasion, his speed served him well. With seven seconds remaining in the ball on the one-yard line, the Bears placed the game in the hands or the foot of kicker John Ravetto. Ravetto did not disappoint. He drilled home a Bears victory from 18 yards away as Chicago upset the Lions 20-17.
For a team that had played so poorly before the strike, the win was something of a salvation. With the strike-shortened season and a revamped and more lenient playoff structure, the Bears can make the playoffs with just a few more exhilarating performances like the one against Detroit. It was the Bears' first win under first-year coach Mike Ditka, and perhaps it will be a sign of better things to come. For it was a rookie named McMahon that played the starring role in this Chicago victory.